Hello, welcome to Deep Into Sleep. This is Ishan. Today we will continue our conversation with Julie Flygear. She founded the Project Sleep organization after receiving her own diagnosis of narcolepsy in 2007. Today's episode, she will share more helpful resources and community support resources for all those dealing with narcolepsy. I'm sure you can also find the stories she shared about herself is very encouraging and inspiring for you. For someone who just start experiencing symptoms, or they been having some kind of symptom for a while, but they don't know what it is, what are some ways for them to、uh, look for help, look for communities, and try to get diagnosed? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think that you know it's really helpful to connect with other people living with narcolepsy and with the organizations.、Um, and so there are a few different great ones here in America, but there's also different organizations around the world.、Uh, so here in America, there's、um, Narcolepsy Network. There's another organization called Wake Up Narcolepsy, and there's an organization called the Hypersomnia Foundation. That is really super helpful for people living with idiopathic hypersomnia, and of course, Project Sleep has resources as well. And you know, across the different、uh, conditions, there's a KLS Foundation for Klein-Leven syndrome. There's an RLS Foundation. There's the American、uh, Sleep Apnea Association.、Uh, and so there's you know really different. I'm trying to think. Oh, I'm forgetting one. The Circadian Sleep Disorders Network for people. Oh、listening. yes. <laughs> Um, I'm sure I'll still forget some, but、um, there's these great organizations. I think that they have good resources, and they can always usually connect you to other people.、Um, and you know, I think just really advocating for yourself that you need to see a sleep specialist、uh, if someone hasn't yet been diagnosed.、Um, that you know, primary care doctors might、um, they might discard uh, the uh, complaint because they. Aren't really educated on sleep disorders. So one of the things I like to let people know is that,、uh, you know, a general medical school curriculum might include an hour of all of sleep, and that's just a really inadequate amount. So, right, with a primary care doctor, they might know close to nothing about sleep and sleep conditions, and so it's 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 not their fault, but they might actually、um, they might actually kind of like perpetuate misconceptions just from like. There's there like our general societal misconceptions as opposed to be giving you like medical information.、Um, so you know, I just try to let people know to go see a sleep specialist for sure. Yes, yes, that's so important. I think a lot of、uh, providers across different healthcare fields all kind of know the basic sleep hygiene stuff, some basic、uh, sleep deprivation, some basic ideas about. Uh, limited numbers of sleep disorders, but if in only one to several hours of training,、uh, definitely not enough because sleep is such a wide and deep field with all this more than.、Um, Last time I saw, I think it's more than ninety different type of sleep disorder already recognized, and a lot of those are still not recognized by us yet. And、uh, um, I think a lot of providers may. Just miss that, or I think the biggest challenge for a lot of people who are trying to figure out what's what's going on with them is they may not even think about this something sleep related, right? Right, and so you know, a primary care doctor that I saw, and I this is once I realized I might have a sleep problem. If you look back at the notes, it's like it's like textbook narcolepsy. I, I my first complaint was I think I might have a sleep disorder. I described having trouble driving and and having trouble with my coursework, and then the second thing I brought up was that my knees were buckling with laughter or when I was annoyed. And so, if you look back at that, like those are the two major symptoms of narcolepsy, and she completely missed it.、Mm-hmm. Um, so she suggested depression and you know check my thyroid and my iron levels, which I understand are more common. You know, those are the good things to check first. Um, but you know, interestingly, I did see a therapist at the, because I I didn't feel like depressed. I I feel like I'd been through some depression earlier in my life, and that this didn't feel that way. I just felt tired, but I also just felt really out of control.、Um, and so I went to the therapist anyway,、um, just because you know 
I'll, I would do anything at this point to feel better. Um, and then interestingly, I found cataplexy and narcolepsy like a week later. And so then I realized, okay, I don't need to go see the therapist, but I, um, I just went to the next appointment because it seemed easier to go than to cancel the appointment. And so I went and I realized I really liked talking to her and that I kept her for the next two years as my therapist to help me process my experience of adjusting to narcolepsy. Um, and so I kind of bring that up now as an example that yes, that was because a primary care doctor really misunderstood my condition. But at the same time, I don't think I would have gotten diagnosed with narcolepsy and thought, oh, maybe I should see a therapist to help me process this experience. And so I'm really glad that that's how that happened for me, because I think um, social support and the importance of um, processing the emotional and psychological parts of adjusting to something so big um, are really underrated. Yes, I think you really brought up a good point that not only it's hard to get diagnosed, but after being diagnosed, how do we deal with this this um, condition? How do we deal with this emotional difficulties? How to con- how to basically coexist with this condition and still live a a fulfilled life? from there that's all something um like we have to face once the diagnose is there right and it's probably you know like all things a journey of a lifetime um so we're always working towards it but i just feel so strongly that i want people with um you know these different diagnoses that are often so invisible right sleep is something that our society doesn't understand and so are uh, but it's quite invisible uh, and people aren't seeing the symptoms always. Uh, and uh, so, and I also think there's a lot of stigma and misunderstanding. And so, um, you know, that people should never feel alone uh, and they should try to connect with other people living with the condition. Um, but also that, you know, they can also seek support like through um, support groups. And like for me, therapy was super, super helpful um, to process you know, a lot of how my friends, there was a lot of disconnect there. Um, and my boyfriend at the time, he broke up with me saying that we weren't having fun a few months into my diagnosis. So there was a lot to process there. Um, and ultimately I ended up changing the direction of my career. Um, I thought at first, no, I'm just going to continue to be a lawyer. Um, I'll finish law school and become a lawyer. And I slowly started to realize that I want to do something more alternative and want to work on writing my book and um, advocating. And so my therapist actually helped me process all of that because I, I knew that like my dad was a lawyer. So I knew that he wanted me to be a lawyer. And so I had a really hard time addressing that with him as I was seeing that my path um, for my career was going to change. And so my therapist was like the first person I could talk to about some of that as well. Um, And I'm so glad I did make that choice because, you know, now I just, I have this dream job and, and uh, get to, to run this organization I love and believe in, but it wasn't so easy to just, it wasn't like I just got this diagnosis and the next day was able to just change my whole life around it and build this organization. It was a huge like process. Right. Wow. That sounds like quite a long journey and a lot of um, internal conflicts you have to uh, walk through. You have to figure it out with some some support around you. Definitely. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. You mentioned all this like organizations, this this social support, communities there, knowledge is there. There are people out there with similar conditions or more knowledge about different sleep disorders can really help those who are still struggling or uh, facing the difficulties of their own symptoms. Yeah, I think, you know, there's, for me, myself, I know I really resisted at first to connect with other people with narcolepsy. Mm. I thought it might be weird or something. I don't know what I thought, but I just didn't, like the idea of going to a support group or something um, didn't resonate with me personally. And then my dad and my stepmom took me to a narcolepsy network conference. And by being there, you know, I realized, oh, this is really great. Uh, you know, for one weekend, like narcolepsy was normal and like all these people were fantastic, 
uh, individuals, you know, all sorts of different people had narcolepsy and um, we both had a lot in common, but also, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a variety of people were there. And so I, I know that can be something that is like not always something we want to embrace because it maybe makes us feel like we're like talking too much about our narcolepsy maybe, or, you know, that that somehow makes us weak. Um, but I found that actually it's really important to um, be part of that community and it makes me stronger. And then I actually, I think also like a lot of my friends that might not have understood my narcolepsy, um, once I had my whole narcolepsy community, I didn't need to have that same connection with all of my friends in my you know daily life. So maybe I connected about art with a friend um, or I love to go dancing with a friend and maybe that friend didn't quite understand my narcolepsy. But once I had this other part of my life where I could talk about it, you know, it kind of like relieved pressure on some of those relationships a little bit to know that, you know, maybe there are some limitations there, but um, that I still connect with some people on different levels. Mm, sounds much more flexible, more freedom, and narcolepsy does not have to be the single label we put on ourselves. And it we we could enjoy life, different aspects of life, and narcolepsy could be part of that. And people can find support for that in addition to other aspects of their lives. Yeah, yeah, it's so true too because I think you know the problem with stigma often is that it makes you feel like that having narcolepsy maybe or having a different medical condition or, you know, being a certain race or whatever, that that's the defining quality and that people make assumptions on like everything about you just from knowing that one part, mm -hmm. you know, um, where I'm a runner, I'm, you know, a dancer, I have all these other parts of my personality. And I think that's always really important that we remind ourselves that, you know, we're more than just our profession or, you know, our condition or the color of our skin or whatever, like we all have so many um, different dynamics and so much to connect about. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. I really like that. So do you have a different way to explain your, like explain what narcolepsy is to, to other people or you more like, uh, live with it and choose whoever can are willing to listen to understand choose who to talk to Well, I guess because I'm so, so public and that my job is running project sleep. <laughs> so it comes up a lot for me um, mm -hmm. So I, I was private about it for the first couple of years But once I decided I was gonna write a book and start raising awareness I did a 180 and became super public. So I do tell a lot of people <laughs> from you know a uber driver to um you know i'm i'm dating i'm single so i have to tell potential dates um and uh so you know i think one of the most compelling things um i found that, that people seem to be drawn to is understanding that narcolepsy is a disorder of dream sleep in particular mm. that um you know it's it's um normal for someone every single night they'll become paralyzed so they don't act out their dreams. Um, and um, so that's, you know, and that makes sense to people. They might not have realized that before, but they're like, oh, okay. Um, and then I explain that, you know, when I'm experiencing those emotions during the day, like laughter or surprise, that my brain is misperceiving that emotion for a dream and paralyzing me. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that cataplexy symptom is, uh, you know, actually the paralysis of dream sleep, but happening while I'm conscious. And so people are kind of like, wow, uh, because it it is also goes to show how narcolepsy isn't just about falling asleep. You know, that's kind of the perception. Oh, you, f you fall asleep all the time. Um, but it's, it's, it's much more of this, you know, dysregulation of, of dream sleep in particular involving, you know, the paralysis of dream sleep. Um, and, um, you know, it's, so, and it happens day and night, you know, the symptoms are, are 24 hours a day. Uh, mm. So I find that kind of like one of the interesting things to explain to people um, that seems to really resonate with them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. To, yeah. 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 I really like the way you make the analogy to really help other people for people who are not familiar with it to understand some basic components of it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think, you know, for me personally, it's always about 
trying to explain that, yes, it is a serious condition, but also that I'm doing well, um, you know, that, um, that it, a wide variety of experiences exist. So, you know, there's never just like one patient voice um, because there are so many different factors uh, that influence, you know, how I'm doing. But uh, for me, like, yes, I'm able to drive and I take medication twice a night and once a day and I work full time. Um, but that doesn't mean that everyone with narcolepsy does those things. Um, but, you know, it's important to me to balance explaining that the condition is both serious, but, you know, uh, for me, I, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. And that's why it's so important to me to um, try to make things better for other people that, that might not be able to be on the treatments I'm on or are not able to um, have the same kind of like uh, experience I have. Yeah. So sounds like just like sleep is very individual thing. I think narcolepsy condition is different for different individuals and sounds like there are some treatment existing to help people manage the symptoms, even if it may not eliminate the symptom, but it may be able to contain the symptom to a certain level that to help with daily functioning. Exactly. Yep. Great. Even though I think um, different individuals may uh, be able to function at different levels, even after treatment, right? But treatment and hope is definitely there. Yeah, for sure. And it's an exciting time in the narcolepsy space because there's a lot of drug development underway. And I think the next, you know, three to five to 10 years, we're going to see um, a lot more options available um, that will be, you know, hopefully improving lives even more. Um, so it's, it's a great, it's a great time because actually now it's been 12 years since I was diagnosed and there haven't really been any new treatments, uh, for narcolepsy until this year. And there's already been two FDA approved drugs for narcolepsy just in 2019. Yeah, that's great. I think I went to one of those, uh, lectures in the World Sleep Conference. They talk about those, uh, drugs for narcolepsy. Yes, yes. There was a lot of exciting announcements at the World Sleep Meeting. Um, yes. Was, I remember yeah. in one of those meetings, I went to uh, Dr. Chris Winter was one of the speakers. I just interviewed him. He was in one of that uh, talks talking about narcolepsy medications. Oh, good. Yeah, he's so great. He's um, such a great clinician. Obviously, I've he's not my doctor, but I've heard such great things from people that are lucky enough to live in the area where he practices in, in Virginia. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I actually went to school in Charlottesville. So when I found out he was in Charlottesville also, that feels so nice knowing oh. someone from the same area. <laughs> yeah, and one of our Rising Voices of Narcolepsy speakers, um, she talks about an experience where she'd gone over 20 years as well. Um, and, um, you know, the first time that she met Dr. Winters, she felt understood for the first time, you know, wow. um, and just crying and just realizing like she's not, um, you know, it's nothing wrong with her. It's a real thing. Um, so I'm, I'm so grateful to him and, and, and so look up to him in so many ways. Oh, great. Yeah. That's such a relief when you have a provider understand you and help you um, lower this, this burden you've been carrying for so long. I can only imagine uh, how that is a amazing moment for for her. Really? Yeah, great. So um, as a time reaching to an end, I want to know like if there's anyone listening who are having uh, this kind of condition who is either seeking a diagnosis for narcolepsy or being diagnosed, is there anything you want to let them know? Um, just to connect with Project Sleep, I think, and obviously the other organizations I mentioned as well, uh, because people are in such different places, um, but that, uh, and to definitely check out my book, I think that's not only helpful for people with narcolepsy, but clinicians and also family members. Uh, so, you know, often there's a lot of social disconnect uh, with people with narcolepsy maybe, and their families not quite getting it. And so that's been some of the most heartwarming messages I've received of um, family members uh, understanding a lot better after reading my book. Um, so 
yeah, that's, those are like the main things I just like to let people know about Project Sleep and the book. Um, and then there's always lots of social media. I'm big on social media and I love Instagram. So people can always connect with me there. Great. Yes. Yes. Because I was about to ask how people can find you, but I, you can give me all the links or social media accounts you want to share. I can put them on the website and people can find you there. Thank you. Great. So very nice talking to you. Thank you for sharing your story. I think it's very encouraging and inspiring for people who either have narcolepsy or who uh, has other type of sleep disorders to feel more hopeful for their conditions. Thank you. I, I did want to mention also, I forgot to mention that we did this past year start the World Narcolepsy Day. And Great. Um, there is now, you know, September 22nd is a day around the world that we uh, raise awareness and celebrate narcolepsy and the, the experiences of people with narcolepsy. And so we founded that with 24 different organizations around the world. Um, wow, that's awesome. How yeah. people can participate if you know any of us are interested in participating? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to participate. Project Sleep has um, opportunities for people via social media. Uh, we did have some events in person at the World Sleep Meeting uh, this past year. Um, but, you know, we have a, a page on our website dedicated to World Narcolepsy Day and uh, links to all the 24 different organizations around the world that co-founded it because in different countries, they're doing different things, uh, depending on what people, like in Ireland, they had um, kite flying events all over Ireland, um, and they had a ton of media, uh, newspapers and <clears throat> radio shows that were sharing different stories of people with narcolepsy in Ireland. So. Um, you know, it's great to, to be able to connect to those different organizations and see what different people are doing around the world. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I hope China has something similar, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's very, narcolepsy is quite be, uh, aware in, in Asian countries yet. Yeah, there's not to my knowledge, I don't know that there is a narcolepsy patient organization in China. Um, there is in Japan, so mm. we're Japanese organization and I got to actually do a Skype meeting with them uh, over oh, the great yeah. yeah and I correspond with them pretty frequently so um, and they're really excited for next year's World Narcolepsy Day and, and raising awareness but um, I haven't been able to find I know like some great clinicians and researchers mm -hmm. uh, from China but I'm not familiar with any sort of a patient organization there yet yeah I, I know in Taiwan um, they have a they've recently started a um, a, at least a support group get together. Uh, I don't think it's an official organization yet, but um, I'm really glad that they have started bringing the community together in Taipei. Wow, that's awesome. So hopefully there are going to be more and more organizations or at least this kind of support network um, popping up across the whole world. I think a lot of people can really benefit from that. Yes, definitely. Great. Thank you so much for coming to the show and sharing all this wonderful information. Thank you for having me. So many good informations that were shared here by Julie. And hopefully you find some of those are very helpful to you, your friends, or your family members. If narcolepsy is in your life one way or the other, please keep the hope on and keep on enjoying your life. There are great resources and support out there and great treatments available. If you want to share your story, please feel free to contact Julie or me. We would all be very happy to hear from you. To find more of the information Julie shared and the links to Project Sleep, as well as many other organizations, please come to our show note at deepintosleep.co forward slash episode forward slash 020. Thank you for spending today's journey with me together and look forward to seeing you next week. Sleep is an individual thing. We all sleep differently and there is so much we can do to improve sleep quality. Keep hope and carry on. This podcast is for general informational purpose only and does not include the practice of medicine or other health professional services. Usage of the information we share is at the listener's own risk. And our content does not intend to be a substitute for any medical and professional services, diagnoses, and treatment. 
please seek professional health services as needed.